All right, first of all, good morning, good morning, good morning. Our first task force meeting uh, after the beginning of school. So I hope that you all have had a wonderful opening, uh, truly unique, something to tell your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren about school year of 2021. Uh, I'm not going to uh, have a, uh, a lot of announcements because I want to make sure we give our, our special guest, Dr. Sachs, as much um, time as necessary. First of all, this is the meeting of the Task Force on Achieving Academic Equity and Excellence for Black Boys. This is our September meeting. We meet monthly. We are streaming live to the public and we welcome the public's comments uh, either through the board's website or through emails. Uh, also, uh, we will be um, following our usual norms. Please make sure that your microphones are muted unless you are speaking. That prevents any feedback from uh, uh, your background. Uh, we have um, we have uh, several special guests with us today uh, who uh, are here as uh, with under a personal invitation um, from me. Uh, we have principals. First of all, we have uh, Mrs. Glenice Vaughn, uh, principal at Samuel Ogle Middle School in Prince George's County. We have Ms. Crystal Chambers, uh, middle school principal at Centerville Middle School in Queen Anne's County. And we also have Dr. Melinda Johnson, uh, principal of J.P. Ryan Elementary School in uh, Waldorf. Uh, we are about to hear from another one of our guests, Dr. Dara Shaw. Dr. Shaw is the executive director for the State Department's Office of Research and Strategic Data Use. She's going to be speaking momentarily about pre-K um, through two suspension data. Uh, your future, our future meetings uh, next month, we'll be hearing from Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu. Dr. Kanjufu will be talking about how do we change the culture for black boys. And then we'll be hearing, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll be hearing in November from Dr. Melinda Johnson, who'll be coming back to us. Um, and then starting November, December timeframe, that's when we're really gonna get down to our recommendations. All right, with, without further ado, I wanna turn things over to Dr. Shaw. Dr. Shaw, you're with us. I am, good morning. Um, good morning. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, uh, Dr. Green, and thank you to the task force for the invitation. Um, as um, I was introduced, uh, my name is Dara Shaw. I'm the executive director for research at the Maryland State Department of Education. Uh, we have the opportunity to provide all kinds of research and data analysis to inform MSDE's work, to inform the work and the leadership of the State Board of Education, and to support um, other, other groups such as this task force um, that might have questions related to any kind of data that we have um, at the State Department of Education and how we might analyze that, use it, and show it to you to help better inform your efforts. Uh, so this is a, a presentation data that specifically relates to um, suspensions and expulsions of um, pre-K to second grade students. Um, however, again, I'd like to, to put in a plug, we do have a wealth of information at the State Department of Education, um, and it is the, the job and the mission of my office to use that data to inform decision making. Um, and so this is this is just one example of what we can do. So I'm going to um, go ahead and share my screen if I can. There we go. I don't hear any objection, so I'm going to assume that you guys can see that okay. Um, this is a, a summary of two presentations that were given to the State Board of Education. Um, I've already lost, I've already lost my chat window, um, but I just put the links to the original presentations in here. So I'm going to be doing 
um, a slightly different version than what the board saw, just so that I can better inform um, your task force's mission. But there's a lot more information that is available. So, um, in Maryland, we uh, it passed in spring 2017. There was a House Bill 425, Senate Bill 651 that was then entered into the Code of Maryland regulations. That basically says that a pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, first or second grade student may not be suspended out of school or expelled unless federal law requires it or unless there is the serious threat of serious physical harm, um, in which case the student may be suspended along with some supports and interventions. And the question was, all right, we have this, um, this this law as it relates to discipline in the early grades, but what's actually happening in terms of discipline? What does that look like by student group? Uh, so if you've seen me present before, you know that I like to give you the answers right up front. Um, so the first question in 2009, how many out of school suspensions and expulsions were there? Um, the answer is there were about 1200 students who were suspended at least once or about half a percentage point of all pre-K to two students were suspended at least once. So there are still suspensions going on, even with the law. Second question, how did removals diff differ by student groups? Uh, in 2019, about 1% of all black pre-K to two students were suspended. In comparison, only a third of a percent of white pre-K to two students were suspended and about uh, a quarter of a percent of Hispanic students were suspended. By gender, about 1% of all male pre-K to two students were suspended at least once in 2019, in comparison to only 0.15% um, of female pre-K to two uh, students were suspended. Now, if these numbers seem very small, we're talking about fractions of percents, it's because they are pretty small in comparison yeah to the entire range of suspensions in all grades. But remember, the law said that you're not really supposed to have any suspensions in these grades at all. Uh, in 2019, why were pre-K to two students suspended? Um, the answer is it was mostly due to um, attacks, threats, or fighting, 66%, um, with 29% due to disruption or disrespect. So about two thirds were due to an actual physical fight and 30% due to a threat of physical fight. Were student groups removed for the same reasons? Uh, the answer is no, again. Uh, black students were more likely to be removed for just disruption versus white students. White students were more likely to be removed for actually fighting. Um, so white students were less likely to be removed for what a teacher deemed as disrespect or disruption. White students were not removed for that reason as much as black students were. Um, and again, I put in the chat the links to the full presentations, but uh, this was presented to the State Board of Education on June 23rd and August 25th. Okay, so first question, um, were there still students removed by even in 2019? The answer is yes, you can see in the highlighted row. Um, so number of removals was not zero even after the law was passed. Next, by student group. Um, again, I want you to pay attention to the, the column that's highlighted yellow. These are differences by student group. Um, so if you look at the, um, the green line, that's uh, African-American students. Um, and again, in 2019, about 1% of the entire population of uh, black students in these grades was suspended at least once. Um, and you can see the difference by student group here. If I jump ahead to one of my later research questions, you see that drop um, between 2017 and 2018. That's the year that the law was passed that said that you're not supposed to suspend students at all in these grades, except with the imminent threat of physical harm. So you can see that all student groups did experience a drop. Um, for across the board, suspensions were just about cut in half for every single student group. 
but cut in half the dots in 2017, there was still quite a large difference. And so those cut in half means that in 2018, there is still a large difference. Um, and that black, black students in these grades are um, anywhere between three and four times more likely to be suspended. Uh, the next question is why were students suspended? Um, I want to draw your attention to the attacks, threats, and fighting definition, which basically is, is physical. So you push someone, you engage in a fight, um, you bully, you intentionally misbehave to create serious bodily injury, you know, you throw chairs around or things like that. So mm -hmm. attacks, threats, and fighting are actual physical infractions. And disrespect disruption at the bottom of the page is making harmful gestures, making verbal written comments, threats, being insubordinate or defiant, but there's no physical um, physical offense with disrespect or disruption. And these are the other codes. So for all students, again, why were students removed from class or from school? Um, mostly it is for physical infractions. That's that blue part of the pie. Um, with the next largest piece due to disrespect or disruption, um, which is those non-physical, more verbal infractions. But again, the question is, how does this differ by student group? So on the left-hand side, you see um, what we already knew from before is that there are more suspensions for black students than for any other student group. I showed you that before. But if you look at the right-hand side, um, on the bottom row, it shows you that all students, about uh, all students, 29% of them were suspended for disrespect. But if you look at the difference between black and white students, black students, 31% of those suspensions are for disrespect versus white students, only 23% of those students, of those suspensions are for disrespect. So not only are black students being suspended at greater rates than their white or Hispanic peers, but also they are more likely to be suspended simply for acting out, for lack of a better word, than for actual physical fighting compared to their white peers or peers of other races. Um, by gender, you can see that female students are more likely, much more likely than their male peers to be suspended for disrespect. Um, but female students, there are many, much fewer of those st female students are suspended in general. Um, so male students more likely to be suspended than female students, but uh, female students more likely to be suspended for disrespect. And this is by disability status. There's no difference actually by disability status. Finally, what happened when uh, House Bill 425 was implemented? Those are the, the um, rows that I have highlighted. So as you can see, uh, the number of removals was cut from 4,800 to 2,000. So this is good. Um, it's still not zero, but it, the number decreased. And the percent of students who have been suspended at least once, that's what's shown in the graph, was cut just about in half from 1.1% to 0.54%. But again, the question is, what does this look like across student groups? Um, well, for... Uh, across student groups, the numbers were cut just about the same. Sorry, there's no slide on that, um, but it's in the, the large report. Um, so, and we saw it in this graph, uh, as I mentioned, that the numbers after um, HB 425 were implemented, again, the percent of students cut who were ever suspended was cut in half across all student groups. But again, because um, the green line is so much higher than the others to begin with, cut in half means the green line is still higher than the others. Now remember, finally, um, that the intention of 
uh, HB 425 was to not just reduce suspensions, but to also eliminate suspensions or, or greatly reduce suspensions for disrespect. We should not be suspending students in these grades just for acting up. So you can see um, in the right hand side that the, I want you to pay attention to the yellow bars. Um, that yes, the share of suspensions for disrespect did go down in 2000, but not all the way. In 2017, 33% of those suspensions were due to disrespect. That's before the law. 2018, 26% of suspensions were due to disrespect. So it went down from 33 to 26, but it didn't go down to, the yellow bar didn't go down to zero, which is the intent of the law. Now, it did go down. Did suspensions for disrespect go down equally for all student groups? And the answer again is no. So on the left hand side, you see all students. Again, here's that 33% to 26%. But if you look at the first set of bars here, for black students, didn't really change all that much. 2017. 33% of suspensions were for disrespect. After the law, 29% were due to disrespect. Did not change that much. If you look at the right set of two bars, those are white students. Before the law, 31% of suspensions were due to disrespect. And after the law, only 22% of suspensions were for disrespect. So the intent of the law was to reduce suspensions for all students in these grades, which it did equally for black and white students. It cut the percent of students suspended by half, but it didn't change suspensions in the same way. White students after the law were less likely to get suspended just for disrespect. Black students were not. Black students basically stayed the same, their likelihood of being suspended just for acting out. Um, and the next couple slides are by gender and by disability status. So I'm gonna leave it there. How do I stop sharing my screen? Stop sharing, there we go. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Um, again, I, as the, the board members and anyone else on, um, on this call who's seen me present before knows, that I'm certainly not dispassionate at all about this issue, but it is my job to present data to you in a straightforward and uh, dispassionate way as possible so that you can draw the conclusions that you need to um, from, from the data. But I don't want to that to minimize um, how I actually feel about the very important work that you're doing. Um, so I'm happy to take questions or if you have, um, if you want, I'll, I'll, we'll upload this presentation and make it available, but everything that you saw in this presentation is also available in a much longer form in these, those two links that I did send you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw and the links that Dr. Shaw just sent us, um, appear in your chat boxes as well. Um, any questions? Any questions that you'd have, what you would need to do? All right, uh, Dr. Getty. Dr. Shaw, can you tell us about the enrollment of pre-K children across the state by student group? Uh, sure, so it's it's fairly similar to, to the, the statewide demographics of, as a whole. Um, there's, there's, um, there's there's not really that that much of a difference um so the the i don't know off the top of my head but there's nothing unique about the population and and again you know it varies very much by um by local school system too but there's nothing particularly unique about the population demographics of this group of students um so when you see the number of students the number of suspensions for black students much higher than white students it's not because there are four times as many black students as there are white students. Um, and in the in the links um, that you have here, there's also a, um, a value for the number of suspensions per 100 students so that you can see it um, on equal footing. So yes, there are different demographics, but if you divide, if you look at the number of suspensions per 100 students, 
Um, again, for black students, it's um, anywhere between two and four times as many as white students, and that is independent of the population group. And Dr. Getty, I apologize. I, I neglected to introduce you as our, one of our guests. Dr. Susan Getty is a member, also a member of the state board, serving uh, with uh, Senator Bates and Dr. Melanie McCarthy, and um, along with uh, myself. So Dr. Getty has found an interest in our task force, and she will be one of the ones on our state board to vote on our report. So when she expressed an interest in coming, I said, absolutely. In fact, I hope more of our um, board members come as well. All right, uh, I wanna maybe take one, maybe one more question for Dr. Shaw, because we wanna move on and give um, as much time as necessary to Dr. Sachs. Senator Bates. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shaw, uh, do, you, uh, do you have a breakdown of jurisdiction by jurisdiction of the same data? And, and does it track jurisdiction by jurisdiction? Are there some? That are doing a better job, or you know, I just it would be helpful to see, you know, where we need to really uh, work on it. If there's differences, if it's consistent, that that's one thing. But um, yeah, it would be helpful. Um, no. It's a great question. Um, no, it is it is not consistent across jurisdiction. Um, we do have it. It's in the first link that I sent um, from the June twenty third meeting. And it's kind of buried in the, um, not in the PowerPoint, but there's a separate memo that went with the PowerPoint because we always do way more work than we actually show you on the slides. Um, and so there is, um, it is broken down by local school system in, um, in the written report that was not part of the data that I presented. Um, yeah. And if I could, Dr. Green, answer the question that's in the chat very quickly, which is, do we have academic data? Um, the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, and please, I, I um, you know, as your task force works through what data would be limited um, to your work, um, and as Dr. Green and Dr. Sprinkle and, and others, at, you know, who are staffing the task force on MSDE's end, um, please let them know and we can continue to work to present um, actual Maryland data. I, I feel, and I'm sure you do as well, but it's very important to look at not just, um, you know, of course, what what theory and research tells us um, might be happening in our schools, but to look at what is actually happening in our schools as well. This presentation is an example of that. But yes, we do definitely have um, have academic data on um, kindergarten readiness and then um, our state test scores for grades three through twelve. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. We appreciate your being here. And Dr. Shaw uh, has a wealth of information, and it's so important to use that information, to use that data as we make decisions going forward, not just for our task force, but for our state board. And in fact, all schools should really be looking at that data. Data should drive instruction and in some of the decisions that, and really all the decisions that, that we make. Again, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, at this time, uh, I want to just uh, go on to our special guest. Our special guest is Dr. Leonard Sachs. Dr. Sachs is a psychologist and a practicing family physician. In fact, uh, when we scheduled him for, I wanted to schedule him for another meeting. He says, oh, I've got to, I, I can't because I've already got patients scheduled. And I was like, oh. That's so, it's so exciting when you hear from, from a real practitioner and not someone who's just, you know, just kind of uh, uh, um, an academic sort of thing. So Dr. Sachs uh, is a practicing family physician. He's the author of four books for parents, including the New York Times bestseller, The Collapse of Parenting. Uh, we have already read portions of his other book, uh, Boys Adrift. And so without further ado, Dr. Sachs, oh, also Dr. Sachs asks that you hold your questions until the end. In fact, um, if you, uh, uh, on the, in the chat box would post your questions, um, we can ask them, um, or in fact, I, I would really prefer if you have a question for Dr. Sachs at the end of his presentation, if you would just in the chat box, just put question and I'll see the, your name 
and then I will ask Dr. Simpson if she could unmute you and you personally ask your question of Dr. Sachs at the end of his presentation. All right, Dr. Sachs, welcome. Thank you for agreeing to be with us and uh, we turn it on to you. Very good. Well, again, Dr. Green, I want to thank you for inviting me. You uh, mentioned my background. I also would like your colleagues to know that I lived and practiced in Maryland for 19 years. I have visited over 460 schools over the past 19 years, and much of what I'm going to share is based on what I learned uh, visiting these schools. Uh, as you mentioned, I've written uh, four books. I've also prepared a handout for this group. I'll give you this link again. I'm going to be uh, presenting a lot of numbers and, and research very quick. I'm going to talk very quickly because uh, uh, I'm going to cram a lot into an hour's time. Uh, but I want you to know all those numbers are in your handout and I will show you this link again. So again, when we're talking about gender, when we're talking about boys and girls, it's important to be grounded in evidence. Uh, there are many data sets, Dr. Shaw, obviously can get you lots of data, but I like to start with the National Assessment of Educational Progress because it is our nation's only national yardstick. If you wanna compare how kids in Maryland are doing compared to kids in California or New York, this is it. This is the only constant yardstick administered in all 50 states. Again, the link is in your handout and you can break down results by various demographic categories. So let's do that. Let's look at writing in the state of Maryland. You can break it down by a grade at eighth grade, but not at 12th grade. So let's look uh, down at eighth grade. Let's look at African-American girls who are not eligible for, uh, for uh, free school lunches. And let's compare them to African-American girls who are eligible for free school lunches. That's a gap of 17 points, which is quite large. It's almost two grade levels. And I'm sure if I were to ask any of you, why is that? Why do low-income kids do less well than more affluent kids? You'd be able to rattle off a variety of factors. Well, they've got fewer resources. They've got fewer books at home. Uh, they're less likely to have a parent who attended college. Uh, they're less likely to live in a two-parent home. Low-income kids have many well-documented factors uh, that on average uh, seem to drive this robust uh, achievement gap based on household income. But now let's compare that African-American girl who is not eligible for free school lunches with her fraternal twin brother, an African-American boy who is not eligible for free school lunches. And that gap is actually larger. Uh, and the same is true in the white community. These numbers are all in your handout. In other words, on this parameter, being a boy is a handicap in the classroom as severe or more severe than coming from a low-income family. When I started doing uh, some version of this presentation about 18 years ago, I would ask people to raise their hands. Well, why do you think that might be so? And you call on a you know, very distinguished school administrator who, who raises her hand and she says, well, girls have better verbal ability. And I would say, well, no, they don't. Uh, people used to believe that back in ancient times, 30 years ago, back in 1990. But uh, throughout the 1990s, Janet Shibley Hyde and her colleagues at the University of Wisconsin-Madison published a series of a famous studies showing that there are no robust innate differences in verbal ability or spatial ability. Those differences are practice effects that can be eliminated in the lab in an hour's time. Uh, but you know, I'd read my feedback and people would say, boy, that Dr. Sachs was really disrespectful to our school principal. He asked people to raise their hands. She raised her hand and he mocked her and laughed at her. So when I do these presentations, I no longer ask people to raise their hands and guess what drives the gender gap in academic achievement. Because the fact is, even experienced school administrators don't know. In the United States, they generally give the wrong answer and you don't want to embarrass them. So I don't ask them. Uh, this is not confined to tests of verbal ability, uh, and it is not confined to any particular demographic. Uh, it is not confined to the low end of academic achievement. When you look at who's participating in AP exams last year, girls outnumber boys 62 to 38 in the biology exam. Uh, girls outnumber boys by uh, 
66 to 34 in the psychology exam, nearly a two to one uh, advantage. Uh, similar numbers in English literature. Uh, in Spanish literature, it was slightly more than two to one, uh, girls to boys. Uh, in fact, boys are now underrepresented by wide margins in Chinese, in European history, in government, in statistics, U.S. history, world history. This is all in your handout. Well, maybe girls are getting smarter. If that were the case, this would not be a cause for concern. This would be cause for celebration. But the evidence strongly suggests that that is not the case. So let me give you just one line, one quick line of evidence. Uh, back 40 years ago, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, not the National Education Association, but the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, administered a large and demographically representative survey of American kids asking them, what do you like to do for fun? What do you do in your free time? And they documented across the United States in every demographic group that girls were somewhat more likely to read for fun than boys were. More recently, uh, Mark Byerlin and his colleague Sandra Stotsky went back and did it again. Uh, again at the National Endowment for the Arts and again surveying a large and demographically representative sample of kids across the United States. And they found that that gender gap in reading has widened. Uh, quoting from their report, the gender gap has become a chasm. Uh, why is that? Are girls more likely to read for fun than they were 40 years ago? No, girls today are less likely to read for fun than they were 40 years ago but American boys have stopped reading altogether. Uh, they, uh, again, quoting for their report, reading for fun has become a marker of gender identity. Girls read, boys don't. This gender gap is widening, not because girls are doing better, but because boys are doing worse. And we have a robust uh, uh, collection of data documenting that uh, in the popular uh, media, Business Week had a cover story devoted to this. Uh, 10 pages of charts and graphs showing that on a wide variety of parameters, who's earning the best grades, who's participating in academic clubs, valedictorian, yearbook, school newspaper, the wide and growing gender gap, not because girls are doing better, but because boys are doing worse. This is the opening two-page spread of that Business Week article. The top panel shows the stars at this particular high school. Uh, the valedictorian, the editor of the school newspaper, the president of the student council government, all girls. The bottom panel shows the kids in remedial reading at that high school, all boys. Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration looking nationwide. When you look at American public schools, coast to coast, you do find some boys who are high achievers, boys who are valedictorian, boys who are winning the spelling bee. But when you look in a more granular way and ask who are those boys, you find that they are disproportionately likely to be East Asian and South Asian boys. They or their parents were immigrants from Korea, from Indonesia, from Malaysia, uh, from India. For white, black, and Latino boys, working hard to get a good market school is now seen as unmasculine. And this has consequences beyond K through 12. You ask who's attending American four-year colleges who's earning a degree, a four-year degree for an American college. Last year, women outnumbered men 57 to 43. But when you ask who is graduating with highest honors from an American college, you find that the gap is wider, that women graduating with highest honors now outnumber men three to one. And that's a huge change from 40 years ago. 40 years ago, men were uh, disproportionately represented among those graduating with highest honors. Uh, uh, 40 years ago, women were more likely than men were to drop out of college, um, very often because they were getting married and starting a family. Uh, today, men are more than twice as likely to drop out of a four-year college compared to women. And it's seldom because they're staying home to raise baby. More often, it's because they're going back to their parents' home to play video games in the basement. Why? It has nothing to do with verbal ability or spatial ability. That can't change in 40 years. It has to do with motivation. The correct answer to the question, why is there a growing gender gap in academic achievement across the United States for black, for white, and for Latino boys? The correct answer is because those boys are now less motivated to achieve compared to their sisters. That is the correct answer. 
Boys today are less likely than their sisters to care about getting straight A's or editing the school newspaper or reading for fun or graduating with honors. All right, that's the correct answer, but it raises another question. Why? Why are black, white, and Latino boys now less motivated to achieve compared to their sisters? This was not the case in the United States 40 years ago, 50 years ago. It is the case today. Why did this happen? So we have a small library of books. Uh, 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 my friend Warren Farrell had a book two years ago uh, trying to answer this question. Uh, Christina Hoff Summers invited me to speak at the American Enterprise Institute on this topic. Richard Whitmire invited me to speak at his conference on this topic. Uh, perhaps one of the most scholarly of these books uh, was written by Kay Heimowitz. She begins with a torrent of statistics uh, documenting this growing gender gap, not only in college, but among young adults, among young Americans who do not have children at home. You will find in her book, young women now earn more than young men do. And that's really new in American history. Um, and why is that? And well, she and many others like Richard Whitmire uh, assert uh, that, well, young men no longer have a sense of purpose. 50 years ago, Kay Hamowitz said men knew what their role was. Their role was to be a provider in a single in a single earner household, single earner two parent household. They had to earn money to impress a woman to marry them. But now she says young men are adrift because, quoting from her book, they're uncertain about their role as providers in the global marketplace of the 21st century. And that's a, a notion that you'll see pretty widely uh, in uh, the American mainstream and it is mistaken. And I think it's important for you to know that it is not accurate. How do I know, how can I say with such confidence that I'm right and Kay Heimowitz and Richard Whitmire are wrong? Well, unlike Kay Heimowitz, unlike Richard Whitmire, I have visited over 400 schools. And I was visiting an elementary school. And uh, the first event in my day uh, on the agenda that the principal and I had agreed on was that I would meet with the principal in her office. And I was sitting in the office uh, in the first period of the day, waiting to meet with her. And there were nine students in the office um, who happened to be in first, second, and third grade. Nine students, all boys, they'd been sent down for discipline referrals already, less than an hour into the school day. Already had nine kids who'd gotten in trouble. And I asked them, uh, why are you here? And they explained, well, we got in trouble. And then I asked him, what, what do you think about school? And uh, one boy says, school's stupid. Another boy said, school's for girls. And another boy said, I hate school. And I, I tried to get them to talk a little more. And this is one thing I'm, I'm pretty good at as a psychologist and family doctor. I'm, I'm pretty good at getting young kids to, to talk. Uh, why do you feel that way? Tell me more, tell me more. When kids know you're interested, they will talk. Uh, not one of these kids said anything remotely like, well, I'm uncertain about my role as a provider in the global marketplace of the 21st century. Not one of these boys said anything like that. Uh, this boy said, hey, Damien and me were pointing fingers at each other saying, bang, bang, you're dead. Uh, Jason and me were on the playground throwing snowballs at each other and we got in trouble. Another boy said that the, our teacher said we could draw a picture of anything I, we want. And I drew a picture of machine gun. And I got set down here because apparently there's some rule you're not allowed to draw a picture of a machine gun. Schools have become unfriendly to boys. Boys doing things that boys have always done now gets you in trouble. That's a big part of the answer to the question, why do boys now regard academic achievement as unmasculine? Now, we just saw those slides from Dr. Shaw. Uh, again, summarizing Dr. Shaw's presentations, just the big numbers. Across the state of Maryland in 2019, there were 2,009 boys who were removed from school compared with 302 girls, a ratio of more than six boys for every girl. And these are little kids, pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. So many of you have had a chance to look at my book where I try to tackle this question, why? Why are boys now less motivated to achieve? I identify five factors driving this growing up epidemic of unmotivated boys and underachieving young men. 
and you all work with educators. So I want to focus on what happened in American education over the past 30 years. Four changes, which I documented, and some of you have read about this. Schools becoming unfriendly to boys. Abolition of competitive formats. Today, we live in a culture of everybody gets a trophy. But the problem with everybody gets a trophy is that if everybody gets a trophy, for a lot of boys, that trophy ain't worth anything. Shift away from experiential to didactic learning, and this is well documented. 30 years ago, kindergarten kids were more likely to get in a bus and go to the park and splash in a pond and chase after tadpoles. Today, many fewer field trips in the early years. Those kids are indoors. They're looking at a video about how tadpoles become frogs. It's didactic rather than experiential. And we have good research from longitudinal cohort studies showing that that boy who had the experience at five years of age is much more likely at eight years of age to be really interested in how tadpoles become frogs. If he's never had that experience and only watched the video, he doesn't care. An acceleration of the early elementary curriculum. In 1990, most American kindergartens did not expect kids to learn to read and write. Today, they do. And living in Montgomery County, I vividly remember Dr. Jerry Weiss, the superintendent of Montgomery County Public Schools, boasting about how he was eliminating or reducing recess and music to uh, have rigorous, it was his favorite word, Dr. Weiss' favorite word, rigorous, rigorous academics. And that was before we had the MRI scans. The first MRI scan looking at the brain of normal five-year-old boys and girls comparing gender in brain anatomy wasn't published till 1999. Dr. Weiss was done by then. Uh, nobody knew that the areas of the brain involved in language in the five-year-old boy looked like the brain of a three-and-a-half-year-old girl. It turns out to be not developmentally appropriate to expect a five-year-old boy to sit still, be quiet, and learn about diphthongs. But let's dig a little deeper because there's more research that informs best practice for the instructional strategies in the content areas K through 12. And I want to share that framework with you. And this is not in Boys Adrift. This is in another of my books, Why Gender Matters. So in Why Gender Matters, I cite 12 studies in which researchers gave young kids, three, four, five, six-year-olds, a choice of playing with a doll or a truck. What happens when you give little kids a choice of playing with a girl toy like a colorful doll or a stereotypically boy to toy like a doll gray truck? So on the right are girls, on the left are boys. Gray is the amount of time spent playing with the uh, doll. Black is the amount of time spent playing with the truck. The average girl spends more time playing with the doll than she does with the truck, but there's a lot of variation among the girls. The girls do spend some time playing with the truck. The boys spend much more time playing with the truck than they do with the doll. This is not a new finding. I first encountered studies like the, this 40 years ago. In, 1990, in 1980, 1980, I was a uh, graduate student earning my doctorate in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. I took a graduate seminar in developmental psychology with the late Justin Ehrenfried. And he presented these data to us. This is an old finding that is robust over time. It is just as true today as it was 40 years ago. But Justin Ehrenfried asked, why is this? Why do girls play with dolls and boys play with trucks? He said, it's because of the social construction of gender. He said, we teach kids how to do gender. And by three years of age, girls have figured out, yeah, girls are supposed to play with dolls rather than trucks. And so on average, they do. But he said, we send a much stronger message to boys. We tell boys that boys are absolutely supposed to play with trucks and never, never play with a doll. And by age three, the boys have gotten that stronger message. And there's very little variance. Uh, boys pick up the doll, realize it's a Barbie doll, and drop it like a hot potato. These differences, Professor Aaron Fried said, reflect the social construction of gender. I did not question that. I don't know of anyone who did. I am convinced, as you know, I've been doing presentations on this topic now for 18 years. You will never resolve this question of nature versus nurture if you look only at human data. And in all four of my books, I present data from other primates, other, especially other hominids, humans, chimpanzee, gorilla, bonobos, orangutans, giving the same choice to monkeys. 
and her findings have subsequently been replicated by Kim Wallen studying a different species of monkey and by Richard Rangham uh, and his colleagues observing chimpanzees. Uh, here are the monkey data. The female donkey, monkey slightly but not significantly prefers to play with the doll rather than the truck. The male monkey significantly prefers to play with the truck rather than the doll. Now you could try to invoke the social construction of gender to explain this difference in monkeys. You would have to assert that the monkey in authority is saying something like, uh, now son, I don't want to see you playing with a doll. But this does not happen. Uh, the researchers who've done this work say that the monkeys in authority are paying no attention to the choices paid by the ju juvenile. It makes no difference whether you conduct the study in the colony or in isolation. You cannot plausibly invoke the social construction of gender to explain this finding in monkeys, the preference of the juvenile male to play with a doll, uh, truck, to play with a truck rather than a doll. You can invoke the social construction of gender to explain the difference across species. The main effect, which is the preference of the juvenile male to play with a dull gray truck rather than a colorful doll, is more pronounced in humans than it is in monkeys. Why is that? Why is it more pronounced in humans? Well, because of the social construction of gender. Uh, or, uh, as Dr. Melvin Connor has said in explaining exactly this difference, the uh, greater magnitude of this effect in human males rather than primate uh, monkeys, Dr. Melvin Connor says, culture stretches biology. And you'll find that phrase in your handout, culture stretches biology. The main effect, the preference of the juvenile male to play with a, a uh, colorful, uh, a dull gray truck rather than a colorful doll, that main effect must be hardwired because it is observed in four different primates, human, chimpanzee, and two species of monkey. It is more pronounced in our species than in monkeys because of the social construction of gender, because culture stretches biology. All right, well, that's plausible, but we still have not explained the main effect. Why is it the case that juvenile males, whether human, chimpanzee, or monkey, greatly prefer to play with a dull gray truck rather than with a colorful doll? Dr. Alexander was the first to document this finding in a non-human primate and also the first to propose a plausible explanation. And it is her explanation that many teachers and administrators have found useful in creating boy-friendly instructional strategies. So I think it is worth a, a, just a moment to explain what Professor Alexander is saying. To understand Professor Alexander's construct, uh, you must remember what you learned about the visual system when you took uh, high school biology. You learned about the rods and the cones the photoreceptors that convert light into a signal brain can, the brain can understand. You recall that the rods are uh, black and white sensitive and they're all through the retina. The cones come in three varieties, red, green, and blue, and they're concentrated at the center of the field of vision. You may recall the next layer in the retina, the ganglion cells that convert, li uh, that, convert that information from the rods and cones and process that data. The ganglion cells also come in two varieties, the little cells concentrated at the center of the field of vision that get their information only from the cones, and the big cells all throughout the retina that get their information mostly from the rods and a little bit from the blue cones. Uh, we've known now for more than 30 years that there are two visual systems in the brains of all higher primates. One arises from the little ganglion cells and it's answering the question, what? What is it? What is its color? What is its texture? The other visual system arises from the big ganglion cells and it's answering the question, where? Where is it going? How fast is it moving? This is an old slide, more than 20 years old, passed over Keechan, his colleagues, Yale University School of Medicine, mopping, mapping out the visual system in humans. The little ganglion cells send their information to the P or parvocellular division of the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus, then on to Broadman area 17 and human occipital cortex. The big ganglion cells send their information to the M or magnocellular division of the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus, and then onto HOC5, area five of human occipital cortex. Two visual systems operating in parallel, one processing information about color, detail, and texture, the other processing information about speed, direction, movement. Nothing new about that. That's old hat. Professor Alexander was the first to argue that the M system greatly predominates in primate males. The P system slightly predominates in primate females. When she first made that argument, it was a conjecture, a hypothesis, but over the past 17 years, we've gotten a great deal of information that provides strong support 
for Professor Alexander's hypothesis. For example, Katrin Amundsen and his, her colleagues in Germany taking slices through HOC5 in the human occipital cortex, that area of the brain looking for speed and direction. Find you can take a slice through a human brain, hold that slide up to the light, and say without error whether that piece of brain came from a man or a woman. There is no overlap in the sexes. Uh, Robert McGivern and his colleagues, uh, college students sitting at a computer terminal. On the terminal, there is an object which is changing color uh, and shape and uh, direction and speed. And then it vanishes. And at the moment it vanishes, the student is asked, at the moment it vanished, match its color, match its shape, match its direction, match its speed. Women do much better than men at matching color and shape. Men do better than women at matching speed and direction. Studies like these and many others provide strong support for Professor Alexander's construct. Why is it the case that young girls prefer a colorful doll over a dull gray truck? Because the doll has a more interesting color and texture, Professor Alexander says. Why is it the case that juvenile males, whether human, chimpanzee, or monkey, greatly prefer a dull gray truck rather than a doll? Because it moves, it got, it's got wheels, it goes kaboom. Now, at this point, some of you are thinking, Dr. Vermel Green really goofed. She is wasting our time. Some of you are thinking, I can see how all this talk about MNP might possibly be interesting if I were a neuroscientist interested in sex differences in the primate visual system, but I'm not. I work with schools, and I don't see how all this talk of two visual systems is going to give me anything useful to share with teachers or school principals. I'll just click off and do something else. Well, before you click off, I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine that you teach kindergarten or first grade or second grade, and you've given all your students a blank piece of white paper and a box of crayons. And you said to each of these young girls and boys, draw whatever you want. I cite five studies in which researchers did exactly that. One from the United States, one from England, one from South Africa, one from Japan, and one from Thailand. What happens when you give young children a white piece of paper and a box of crayons and ask them to draw whatever they want? Girls everywhere draw people, pets, flowers, and trees, typically two, three, or four arranged on a horizontal ground. The people have eyes, mouth, clothes. They have, the girls use 10 or more crayons. What do boys do? On this parameter, boys are complicated. Unlike girls, boys form a bimodal distribution of variance, which is highly kurtotic and skewed, which is a fancy way of saying that boys form two clumps, one big and one small. The little clump in each of these five studies, about 8% of boys, roughly one in 12 boys, draw pretty much what the girls draw. They draw people, pets, and trees. Turns out that boys who draw people, pets, and trees have a lot in common with other boys who draw people, pets, and trees. They're at least three times more likely to have allergies, asthma, or eczema sufficiently severe to warrant ongoing consultation with a physician. They may be athletic, but they're not playing football or ice hockey. They're paying, playing tennis, track, or golf because they don't like to hit and they don't like to be hit. And they are much more likely than other boys to become victims of bullying. There's a favorite game among 12-year-old boys is one boy comes up to another boy and says, hey, how about I hit you as hard as I can, and then you hit me as hard as you can. And this boy will say, but I don't want to hit you. <coughs> I don't want to hit you, and I don't want to hit you to hit me. And he runs off, and boom, he's marked as a victim of bullying. I have a different half-day workshop for schools on how do you prevent bullying using strategies that actually work, as opposed to the strategies most often deployed in the United States. And in that workshop, we talk a lot more about these boys, because for a strategy to be effective, you must understand who is the victim, it's not random, and why is he victimized. Uh, but this is not that workshop, and for the remainder of our minutes together, I will have nothing more to say about this boy except for one final comment. He's not gay. We have two boys, Brett and Jason. Brett loves football, likes to hit, Brett turns out to be gay. 
Jason doesn't like football. He'd much rather sit and draw a picture of a flower. Jason is straight. The binaries do not align. Gender is complicated. But just because gender is complicated doesn't mean gender doesn't matter. It does matter. What do most boys draw? In each of these five studies, more than 90% of boys are not drawing people, pets, and trees. They're drawing something completely different. A scene of action at a moment of dynamic change, like a rocket smashing into a planet or a monster beating an alien. It is, uh, it is not a well-organized two-dimensional picture. This boy has written the word tank, so you know this is a tank shooting at the bombers going down in flames on another tank. Then he's rotated the picture upside down and written the word died next to this soldier. You know, you know the soldier has in fact died. Human figures at present are often stick figures, lacking eyes, mouth, clothes. Boys use six or fewer crayons with a predominance of black, gray, silver, uh, blue, and green. This is a robust finding. It makes no difference whether it's a Japanese girl in Japan or an American girl in the United States. Girls everywhere draw people, pets, flowers, and trees. More than 90% of boys are drawing something quite different. Now, I asked you to imagine that you teach kindergarten or first grade or second grade. You've asked all your kids to draw a picture. You are now walking around your classroom. You want to encourage every child. And you come to Emily. Emily did the picture at upper right. And you say, oh, good work, Emily. Uh, what are you drawing here? And Emily says, well, this is her, and here's her little kitty, and here's her little sister and her sister's friend. Well done. I love the faces and the colors. Lovely. Carry on. Now you come to Jared. Jared did the picture at lower right. And you say, good work, Jared, but uh, what are you drawing a picture of? Uh, Jared explains he's trying to draw a car crash at the moment of impact. This car is being crushed between these two. Now, you want to encourage every child, but Jared's making it rather difficult. You say, Jared, honey, uh, you know, car crash, that's really violent. And, and Jared, I don't see any people in your cars. Your cars are all empty. Now, look at Emily's picture. You know, it's so nice and no one's getting killed or paralyzed, you know. Why can't you draw something more like what Emily drew? And now you come to Tyrone. And you say, good work, Tyrone. But you know, Tyrone, you got a whole box of crayons. Why would you draw the vehicle the same color as the sky? Why don't you use more colors? And Tyrone, I don't, I don't see any people in your vehicle. So why don't you put some people in there? There's one thing girls and boys are equally good at every age, as near as we can tell, and that's figuring out what the teacher likes. And it doesn't take the boys very long to figure out they're doing it wrong. I was in a second grade classroom. And teacher said, free time, you can do whatever you want. And some of the girls were sitting and coloring. And one of the boys was running around the room making a buzzing noise. And I got in his way and I stopped him. I said, how come you don't want to sit and draw? And he said, without hesitation, he said, drawing's for girls. Drawing is for girls. I'm sure the teacher never said drawing is for girls. But by not understanding what is the picture the boy is trying to draw? By not understanding gender differences, she is unintentionally reinforcing gender stereotypes. The lack of understanding of gender differences has the unintended consequence of reinforcing gender stereotypes. And you will find that sentence in bold print twice in your handout. The lack of understanding of gender differences has the unintended consequence of reinforcing gender stereotypes. How would you do it differently, knowing what you now know about the two visual systems? Well, best practice begins, I believe, with understanding what is the picture the boy is trying to draw and help him to draw it better. Don't assess the boy's work from the girl's perspective, just as you should not assess the girl's work from the boy's perspective. What would happen if I were, was to assess Emily's picture from Tyrone's perspective? What would I say? I'd say, Emily, nothing's happening in your picture. I know, why don't you have one of them hit the other one? <coughs> I'm not seriously suggesting that though. I'm, I'm being silly. I'm just trying to show how silly it is to assess the girl's work from the boy's perspective. It is just as silly to assess the boy's work from the girl's perspective. Turns out Tyrone wants to make it look like his vehicle's going fast. So I submit the best practice here would be to say, uh, hey, Tyrone, take your gray crayon and show some sand spitting up from behind the wheels and take your black crayon and show some stuff flying off the truck bed. And Tyrone will be encouraged. Excuse me. 
<clears throat> you got to assess the boy's work from the boy's perspective. What is the picture he's trying to draw and help him to draw it better? So Professor Alexander was kind enough to read my, how I uh, present her work and she has given it her stamp of approval. Uh, she agrees that most boys are trying to draw pictures that engage the M system that depicts speed, direction, collision. Most boys are, uh, most girls are trying to draw pictures that engage the parvocellular system with color, detail, and texture. Well, that suggests a hypothesis. If more teachers knew this, you could break down those stereotypes. You could have more young boys who love to draw. And that is not a hypothesis. That is a fact. Margaret Paula Olaf's daughter superintends 17 schools across Iceland, K through eight and pre-K through eight schools. And she and her teachers know all about the two visual systems. She sent uh, 44 of her teachers to attend a uh, two-day conference I hosted on this topic in Chicago, Illinois. She then sent uh, 60 of her teachers to attend a two-day workshop I hosted on this conference in, uh, on this topic in Orlando, Florida. And then in my invitation, she came and spoke at a two-day conference I hosted on gender differences in education in Houston. And she did a breakout, which I attended. And she told us that at each of her 17 schools, since the teachers have had this training, when you say to kids, free time, you can do whatever you want, the boys' favorite activity is color. Boys love to draw. Girls love to draw. I don't believe there's any innate difference between girls and boys in how much they love to draw. But there's a big difference in what they want to draw. And if you don't understand that, you end up with what we have, a country where many boys think that drawing is for girls, a country where when you look to see who is taking the advanced placement exam in art history, you find that American girls outnumber American boys by more than four to one, which is ironic in view of the fact that most of the artists they're studying are men. You gotta assess the boy's work from his perspective. What is he trying to draw? Help him to draw it better. So now some of you are thinking, all right, so maybe this is not a total waste of time if I were interested in teaching visual arts to kindergartners, but I'm not. My big concern is reading, English, language arts. I don't see how this is relevant to my concern. All right, so University of Virginia Falls Church is one of a handful of schools of education in the United States which teach what you have just heard, two visual systems, and how do those differences in vision inform best practice in the classroom? And this was a uh, uh, class for uh, mostly teachers who are working during the day, taking an evening class towards their master's in education. But before the instructor told them about the two visual systems, the instructor just asked each of these students to go to the cafeteria, the library, and just write 300 words about what you saw there. And then we're gonna share what you have written. We're all gonna share with one another. Every woman provided lots of detail about things she's seen. The paint was peeling, the carpet was frayed, the food was cold, the lighting was too dim. But in this group, every man wrote about some action he'd observed. These two guys were arguing about the football game. Then this girl came in, she was being chased by this other guy. He was trying to kiss her. She was trying to push, push him away. At first I thought it was sexual harassment, but then she started like giggling. So I figured it probably was not sexual harassment. Help him to write the story that he wants to write. Restate adjectives as participles or as subordinate clauses. Encourage hyperbole. Instead of his feet smelled awful. How about his feet smelled so awful the flowers wilted and died. I went from Scott, Hume's Elementary in Tampa, Florida. This is a Title I school and Tampa, the school district of Hillsborough County, Florida, like all big school districts now, has big data on all their teachers. We have four years of data showing that boys enter her third grade classroom scoring at the 28th percentile on the district assessment of writing. After one year with Denise Scott, those boys now score at the 60th percentile on the district assessment of student writing. No other teacher in this huge school district has accomplished anything like that. That's why I was there. I was there to learn from her. She is a gifted teacher of boys, and we can learn from her. Suzanne Collins begins the Hunger Games trilogy by describing a cat as having a mashed in nose, half of one ear missing, eyes the color of rotting squash. 
She could have said goldenrod eye. She could have used an adjective, but she didn't. She restated the adjective as a subordinate clause, eyes the color of rotting squash. That's boy-friendly writing, and boys love the Hunger Games. Why do boys love the Hunger Games? What's the essential plot of the Hunger Games? The essential plot of the Hunger Games is a teenage girl who is loved by two boys, and she has to choose between them. Hmm, that's familiar. It's exactly the same plot as the Twilight books, <coughs> which is also about a teenage girl who is loved by two boys and have to, has to choose between them. But boys hate the Twilight books. Why do boys hate the Twilight books? There's a number of reasons. One is the writing. In the Twilight books, you'll find words like avocado and pumpkin used not as nouns describing things you eat, but as adjectives. It's girly, it's flowery, and it disengages many boys. Offer more opportunities for free writing. Encourage every student to write about whatever you want. When you do that, you will find that some boys, not all boys, not most boys, but some boys want to write violent stories. So I was speaking in Dulwich, which is a suburb of London, England, on this topic, boys adrift talk using British data. And after I spoke to parents, a husband and wife came down to share their story. They have an older daughter, younger son, older daughter doing very well. Younger son had not been doing well at that co-ed school, so they moved him to a boys' school. Because for a boys' school to survive in this era, they have to know how to engage and motivate this boy. The first week at the boys' school, the teacher gave a choice of three writing assignments. One of the assignments read as follows. You are a Roman gladiator. Tomorrow you must fight in the arena. How do you prepare today? That night, mom came into her son's bedroom and said, hey, it's past 10 o'clock, time for lights out. And he said, but I'm doing my homework. And she said, okay. She said it was the first time in his life he'd wanted to stay up past his bedtime to do a writing assignment. He had so many ideas. All right, so you have to fight in the arena tomorrow, so what do you do today? You get a chicken and you chop its head off and you rip it to pieces and you smear the fat on your shield, make your shield slippery, and then you drink the blood. And the parents were excited to share this story with us because this boy had done a complete 180. In one year's time, this boy who hated school became a boy who loved school. This boy who hated to write became a boy who loved to write. But surely some writing is out of bounds. So back in the United States, visited a high school, 10th grade English, teacher said, write about whatever you want. Boy chose to write about the Battle of Stalingrad, winter 1942, from the perspective of a Russian soldier. And he's on patrol. And he is ambushed by a German soldier who's trying to stab him with a knife so as to make no noise. And he fires his rifle at point blank range in the face of the German soldier and then describes what happens when you fire your rifle at point blank range at another man's face. What happens is that the head explodes. Piece of brain goes one way, piece of eyeball goes another way, piece of chin with tooth still attached goes another way. This boy was suspended from his high school and parents were told he would not be allowed to return until the parents had obtained a uh, evaluation by a, a licensed professional who would have to write on stationery that this boy posed no imminent danger to himself or to others. And when the parents shared that story with me, it really struck a chord with me personally, because I wrote a similar story. I attended public schools in Ohio, K through 12. And in 12th grade, our lead teacher for English, uh, Robert Hansen, nominated me and three other students to sit for a national competition administered by the NCTE, National Council of Teachers of English. And I wrote a story about East German refugees trying to escape to West Germany, crossing a minefield in the middle of the night at the border. And one of them, they've almost gotten to the West German border when one of them steps on a mine which blows off his left leg to the hip and his right leg below the knee. So he now has no feet left. He has blood pouring out of the stumps where his, his lower legs used to be. And he's crawling west toward the border and the East German soldiers are, have turned their spotlights on him and they're firing at him and narrowly missing. And the West German soldier is calling out encouragement and he makes it the last few feet to the border and the West German guards pick him up to take him to hospital and in that moment he dies. The end. My own mom died uh, in 2008 and going through her papers after her death, I found that she had saved the certificate sent to our home from the NCTE, awarding me their highest honor in creative writing. Boys have always written about violent combat and traumatic amputation, 
40 some years ago, it could get you a prize as it did for me. Now it gets you a discipline referral. Boys doing things that boys have always done. Pointing fingers at each other saying, bang, bang, you're dead. Throwing snowballs at one another. Drawing pictures of weapons. Boys doing things that boys have always done. Now gets you in trouble. That's what I mean when I say that schools have become unfriendly to boys. And it has accomplished nothing. Nothing good. Uh, but I haven't yet answered the question, what's inbounds and what's out of bounds? What's allowed and what is not allowed? It's very simple. Generic and classic violence is allowed. Generic violence means violence which is intrinsic to that genre. If you're writing a story about Roman gladiatorial combat, there will be blood and battle axes and decapitations. And if you are his instructor, that boy's instructor, then your job is to help him to write a, that story better, make it more evocative more vivid, but personal or threatening violence is not allowed. So uh, Mike writes a story about bringing a boy named Mike who brings a knife to school to, to stab a boy named Matthew. And there is a boy named Matthew at the school who's been making fun of him. That's personal, that's threatening, that's not allowed. If you care about preventing actual violence, this is a distinction you must understand. And the boys get this, the boys get this but the teachers and administrators uh, will need uh, some help. And uh, there's more to say about that, but our time is, is short. I love to give examples of schools that have deployed these strategies successfully. So this is a tiny sliver of a two day, 14 hour workshop, which I led uh, at a Catholic school in Chesterfield, just west of St. Louis. Andrea Lynch, sixth grade teacher there, teaches English language arts. And it had always been her custom to begin sixth grade by asking each student to make a diorama or a triptych, a series of pictures, depicting any story you like from the book of Genesis. And this is what one of her students turned in. Genesis chapter four, Cain murders his brother Abel. And she told me she didn't like it. Very bleak, uh, no color. The only color is the blood oozing out of Abel's skull. Uh, no faces, just silhouettes, mostly just black and white. And she didn't think it took very much work compared to what the, her girls turned in. Here's what one of her girls turned in. Genesis chapter one, creation, lots of color, detail, texture. This girl has painstakingly fringed the green paper to give the appearance of, of grass. This is not drawn, this is inlaid paper. This girl has cut out brown paper, white paper, black paper to create the puppy. Likewise, the snail and the elephant, not quite drawn to scale, but still, you know, what mark are you gonna give this? A plus, of course. What mark are you gonna give this? She's gonna give it a very low mark. But then she noticed the rod. This boy had attached a rod to Cain's arm so that you can watch him killing Abel over and over again. And she remembered what I kept saying throughout the two days, 14 hours of that workshop. I kept saying, you've got to assess the boy's work from the boy's perspective. What's the story that he wants to tell? What's the picture that he wants to draw? And she realized it's all about action. And she said to this boy, that was so creative on your part to come up with the idea of a rod so as to engage the viewer in the action of the story. She said, A plus. She said, you know, there's a Dr. Sachs who's coming back next year to lead small group content area workshops. May I please keep this for my personal collection? I'd like to show this to Dr. Sachs when he comes back next year. And she told me this boy's face just beamed. And this boy did a complete 180. This boy had been a mediocre student. He became an outstanding student. He had hated to write. He became a boy who loved to write. And Andrea Lynch believed this happened because she said to him, I want to hear the story that you want to tell. You accomplish nothing good when you say to boys, not allowed to write any violent stories. You don't turn boys into flower children. Instead, boys just say, school sucks. I'm gonna go home and play Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty, where I get rewarded for killing people. School's stupid, school's for girls. You accomplish nothing good by making school unfriendly to boys. Again, when I meet with teachers, we spend two days talking about how you make schools friendly to boys without making them unfriendly to girls. We're learning more and more about this. Instructional strategies for the content areas. We've got good evidence-based strategies for each of the content areas shown here. 
as well as for classroom management, constructing the teacher-student relationship, 14 hours over two days, and we have evidence that this really works. So I led that two-day, 14-hour workshop at a Title I school in Wood County, West Virginia. Now, West Virginia, Title I means low-income white kids. For some reason, the school leadership invited me to do this workshop only for the sixth grade teachers, not for seventh or eighth grade. One of the strategies I shared with them for motivation is team competitive formats. And there's a lot to say about that. And we don't have time for that. You can't just do this randomly or it will fail. But team competitive formats done right can greatly boost achievement for boys. So battle the books. The boys competed against the boys to create the best boys team. The girls compete against the girls to find the best girls team. The best girls team then goes against the best boys team and the boys beat the girls. The sixth grade boys beat the girls and the sixth grade boys then went on to beat the best seventh grade team and then beat the best eighth grade team uh, and then demanded more books to read over the summer. This was an end of school event. This is the championship team at Van Dievender Middle School in Wood County, West Virginia. This costs nothing. The lead teacher went down to the school basement, found an old volleyball trophy, knocked off the ball, took a blue Sharpie and wrote Battle of the Books. Uh, and the boys were thrilled. It costs next to nothing to do this. And it greatly boosts achievement for boys from low income backgrounds. I have led eight days of professional development at the Barack Obama Male Leadership Academy. This is a public school of choice. It is not a charter school. It is under the authority of the Dallas Public School Board, the Dallas ISD. It is all boys. 96% of those boys are black or Spanish speaking. 83% uh, of them qualify for free or reduced student lunches. Students are, and I, as I said, I've spent eight days on four separate visits teaching them everything I have learned about, among other things, the team competitive format. And they assign students to one of four houses and they compete in everything, in the classroom, in hallway behavior, in classroom behavior, in academics and in athletics. And each student can win or lose points for their teams. And every teacher gets professional development in how you do this. Uh, again, we're running out of time. Uh, but you have colors uh, and you have officers and we talk at great length about how the officers are chosen uh, and you post the pictures of those officers right next to the entrance to the school cafeteria. Uh, it is an honor to be elected an officer of the House of Expedition and they get a badge which they wear. Uh, Barack Obama Male Leadership Academy, four houses, house of decree. Each house has a gang symbol, hand symbol that signifies your affiliation. That's Angela Fulbright demonstrating the house symbol, house of expedition, the, the X, house of justice, the J's, house of alliance, the interlocked thumbs, and so many great stories to tell. So uh, Barack Obama Male Leadership Academy, right on South Lancaster Avenue, running through South Dallas, there's a trolley. Uh, that runs uh, down that avenue. And one day, two boys jumped, jumped on a trolley car and they started making their hand symbols to each other at opposite ends of the trolley car. And a older woman went to the security officer on the trolley car and said, officer, there's gang, there's gang members on this, uh, on this car. I just saw them making hand symbols, hand symbols to each other. Fortunately, the officer knew better, and the officer said, ma'am, those are gentlemen of the Obama Academy, signifying their house affiliation. If you understand gender differences, you can motivate every boy and boost academic achievement for every boy, including boys of color from low-income neighborhoods. This is not a guess. I have seen it done. Uh, so again, extraordinary good behavior can earn points for your team. And Angela Fulbright has a PowerPoint presentation each Friday morning attended by the entire school, praising these boys and showing how they won points for their team. In order to earn a bracelet, no boy in the house can receive a discipline referral for seven days, not one boy. Each house has its own bracelet. 
in its house color. Again, this is dirt cheap. It's a two pennies a bracelet at the print shop, but boys want the bracelets. They want the bracelets. And there's one boy, there's one troublemaker who doesn't get it. And the other boys will say, what is your problem? Get with it. You co-opt peer pressure to create a culture of respect in the school where it becomes uncool to be defiant and disrespectful. This works. Her last slide each Friday morning is the overall House standings. Well, this was at the end of May. House of Justice was behind by 8,000 points with one month left in the school year. And Antonio Mascaida said, come on, we got to win. We got to win. We're down 8,000 points. What are we going to do? At this school, and my recommendation, they had created a rule that if a boy reads a book, one of 300 books designated for this purpose in the library, and then takes the computer uh, administered test and gets a score of at least 80% closed book to show that he read the book, he earns 50 points for his house. 50 points. They're down by 8,000 points. Antonio Moscada says, come on, we all got to start reading books like crazy. In our free time, we must read books. And the following week, Antonio Moscaida had read 14 books in one week's time and led the other boys on his team. And in one week's time, these boys, boys of color from low-income neighborhoods, read enough books to earn 3,300 points for justice, and justice came from behind to win. Show me another program that costs nothing that has boys of color from low-income neighborhoods demanding books to read in their spare time. You've got to change attitudes. You've got to motivate. That's what this is about. Recognize gender differences to boost academic achievement. Again, I offer a two-day, 14-hour workshop. Of course, instructional strategies for each content area is most of that workshop. But we also talk about motivational strategies for the classroom and school-wide motivational strategies based on what has actually worked at public schools serving low-income neighborhoods in the United States. You'll find more on these topics in my four books, all of which are available on audiobook. The audiobook cover is shown here. Again, the handout is online. The handout is my name, leonardsachs.com slash marylandtaskforce.pdf. It is case sensitive. It is all lowercase. And you'll find all the numbers and the links, et cetera, in that handout. Again, I want to thank Dr. Green, and I'll hang on for as many uh, questions as you folks care to ask. Wow, wow, wow. Dr. Sachs, absolutely wonderful. All right, um, team members, as I said, if you have a question, just um, in the chat box, just indicate question, and I will call on you. Our first question is coming from Dr. Howard. Dr. Howard, you had a question for Dr. Sachs. Dr. Sachs, could you... Um, stop sharing your yes. uh, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning again, Dr. Sachs. Thank you for your presentation, and I appreciate uh, the text. Um, I did the reading, and I was uh, uh, appreciative of what you uh, shared in the um, in your work. Um, I don't have any questions about the about the work. I support. The idea of, of understanding and learning more about gender differences. My question to you is, why is it that you believe that some schools are not receptive to this in their professional development? Why is it that so many teaching programs ignore the, the, the commitment to teaching about gender differences? Yes, absolutely. That's such a great question. Uh, and you're very uh, charitable when you said some programs. Uh, Unfortunately, the great majority of programs in the United States, the quote, leading schools of education, like Harvard Graduate School of Education, Columbia Barner Teachers College, University of Texas, Austin, absolutely do not teach this. Uh, I was doing this two-day workshop at a school, and uh, then I did the follow-up several months later, and a teacher came to me and she told me how she had offered my book, Why Gender Matters. She's earning a master's in education at the university. And she went to her professor of education and said, I'd like to lend you my copy of Dr. Sachs's book, Why Gender Matters. And she told me the professor literally recoiled, like she'd offered her an unclean thing. 
And the professor looked at the title, Why Gender Matters. And the subtitle is What Parents and Teachers Need to Know About the Emerging Science of Sex Differences. And the professor said, I have no interest in reading such sexist rubbish. Mm -hmm. The notion that the categories of male and female are meaningful and not merely a creation of the patriarchy is now an intensely controversial claim that at most of the, quote, leading schools of education is denied. And at the leading schools of education that I just mentioned, I've debated Professor Rebecca Bigler, who is distinguished professor of psychology at the University of Texas, Austin. She and I did a debate, which was recorded. And she and she, she, she has adopted the, pro, the pronouns G and Jure, not because she's trans, she's not. She's a cisgender female, but she regards the pronouns he and she as sexist tools of the patriarchy. So she will not use those pronouns. She uses the pronouns she and jur to deconstruct the sexist patriarchy of the binary. And this is very common uh, at, at the leading schools of education. Um, uh, so to suggest, so you will say to try saying to them, well, what do you think about Jerry, Jerry and Alexander and her work showing sex differences in the visual system? They have never heard of this and they are, they don't want to hear about it. They have no interest in learning about it. Your claim that male and female matter and that educators can benefit from learning about those differences is vigorously rejected. And most of the leading schools of education, they don't want to hear about it. They will not read the book. They don't want to read the studies. They, they as one principal said to me, you're either an idiot, idiot, you're either an idiot, a Republican, or both. Well, no, this is not about politics. And I'm not a Republican, and I'm not an idiot. We need to get the politics out. Sex differences are robust, and they are meaningful. And we ignore, if we ignore them, the end result is what we have, which is boys who think schools for girls, and girls who think computer coding and physics is for boys. The lack of awareness of gender differences disadvantages both boys and girls. It disadvantages them very differently. It drives girls out of computer coding, physics, and engineering. It drives boys out of school altogether. Uh, so the disadvantages are different, but no one wins. No one is the winner when you ignore gender differences. Thank you for that response. And if you, I don't, I don't see another question in here, so I'm, I'm going to just do a quick follow up, if you don't mind, Dr. Green. Sure. Um, so, so Dr. Sachs, I, I, I'm an equity specialist in Montgomery County, Maryland, and I teach one of the courses called Elevating the Black Male Student, which is a two day module on looking at culture and gender difference. Um, and the teachers in that who participate in that workshop are, like we said, like in in awe about not having you know, received this type of instruction or professional development. But more specifically, how is it that we make sure that, because this is my key recommendation for this task force, how is it that we lead professional development with such a political climate that, that looks at um, the distinctions in, in, in the way that you just described? It's a challenge. And as I told Dr. Green when we spoke on the phone a month or two ago, <clears throat> I have found the best way to sell this is to actually begin. When I speak to a uh, uh, district uh, a school board, I will usually begin with girls under, uh, under representation in computer science, physics, and engineering. And I'll work with someone like Dr. Shaw to get the numbers. If we were to do this statewide, I'd say to Dr. Shaw, get me the numbers on girls. I, the College Board breaks it down nationwide, but it's, it's harder to get the numbers statewide from the College Board. I asked Dr. Shaw, show me who's taking advanced placement computer science, advanced placement physics, uh, advanced placement calculus BC, and I guarantee you, you will find that girls are greatly underrepresented. And ideally, we look over time. So nationwide, I can rattle these numbers off the top of my head. Nationwide in 1987, boys taking AP computer science outnumbered girls 66 to 34. In 2016, boys outnumbered girls in AP computer science 81 to 19. 
So on that parameter, the proportion of high school students taking AP Computer Science who are female, we lost ground. 34% in 1987 dropped to 19% in 2016. The lack of awareness of gender differences disadvantages girls, disadvantages boys. And I will begin by showing how girl-friendly instructional strategies in computer coding triples the proportion of girls who want to pursue studies in computer coding. And what does girl-friendly instruction look like? Again, people have stereotypes. They think girl-friendly instruction means talking about relationships or bunnies or pink. It is none of those things. It is evidence-based, but it is different. Girl-friendly instruction in computer coding and physics and engineering and, and uh, uh, physics, engineering, computer science, uh, calculus is different than it is for boys. Uh, and so that's where I start to win over those uh, people who don't want to, who don't accept the idea uh, that male and female matter. They do matter and they are cars and girls to be underrepresented. By starting there, I win over those school board members who otherwise would not be supportive of a program aimed at helping boys. And I say, let's teach every teacher gender-specific instructional strategies to engage and motivate every girl beginning in elementary school, in the physical sciences, in coding, to engage and motivate every boy in English, language arts, creative writing, uh, make it more balanced. If you come in and you just talk about boys, so, so for example, as I, I shared this story with Chris Spence, excuse me, I shared this story with Dr. Green. Chris Spence, black director, we, we would say superintendent, but in, in Ontario, the term is director of the Toronto District School Board, which is the fifth largest school board in North America, a very large school system. He saw these data. Black boys in Toronto are falling behind. And he brought me in to speak to the school board in support of his uh, initiative to boost achievement of black boys. Before that day, he was very popular, but the elected trustees of the Toronto School Board were offended. One of them said, hey, men control most of the money and most of the power. I don't understand why we need an initiative to help boys. I don't care about your data. Women are disadvantaged. Women are discriminated against, and, and I will not support this. And he had a revolt. And the majority of his trustees voted against him. And there's more to the story of Chris Spence than what I just shared, but a year later, he was out of office. Uh, if you just, and I warned Dr. Green about this, and she and I talked about it, and it's something that all of you need to discuss is, my great concern is that if you go to the state board and you say, we need an initiative just to help boys, there is a risk that I have encountered personally that some board members will say, hey, I don't buy it. Men control most of the power. Look, 50 years ago, fewer than 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs were women. Today, fewer than 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. We have made no progress on that parameter. Despite all the lip service, we've made no progress on that parameter. Uh, so why do we need an initiative just to help boys? My concern is that that's what you will encounter. It's for you as the leadership to decide how best to present this. You folks know the Maryland State Board of Education. I don't. And if you think, hey, the Maryland State Board of, uh, 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 Maryland State Board of Education is ready to support an initiative just for boys, then go for it. You know them, I don't. But I do wanna echo your support, your concern, Dr. Howard, that there may be some pushback. If you just come to them with an initiative for boys, that you may get some pushback, as I have seen across the United States, um, and that you are more likely to be successful, in my experience, if you say, hey, we're ignoring gender differences, and the result, and I'm sure Dr. Shaw can get you the numbers, that when we look statewide at who's taking advanced placement computer science, and who's taking advanced placement physics, and who's taking advanced placement uh, calculus BC, girls are greatly underrepresented and boys are disadvantaged as well in other content areas. Let's have an initiative that 
recognizes the the science, the reality of gender differences that the departments of neuroscience are documenting that most departments of education are ignoring, know nothing about. Let's use this new science, let's use this evidence and this experience from public schools serving low-income neighborhoods across the United States. Let's bring that experience to Maryland to boost achievement and engagement for every boy and for every girl. I think that might be a more, an easier sell than just presenting the data showing that boys are falling behind girls and saying we need an initiative just for boys, you can try. And again, you folks know the Maryland Board of Education, I do not, but I've seen, I saw Dr. Spence try it and he was the most charming man and friendly man. He played football in the Canadian Football League, He's a big beefy linebacker kind of guy, very funny, very friendly, and he got crucified because he wanted a program for black boys. All right, all Thanks. right. Challenges before us. Thank you, Dr. Howard, for your questions. I don't see any other questions. I do see a comment from uh, Ms. Fisher. Uh, Ms. Fisher, did you want to make your comment or you want me to just read it? Um, I just was being profoundly struck again by that importance of people understanding bias and just the filters that we use and how it's having such an impact from the very beginning of when a child enters school. Um, and we've had discussion about that greatly, about the increase in you know, male behavior issues and the fact that predominantly females are educators and just our differences in how we see things. So that was fascinating to just listen to you talk about that again, so. Thank you, thank you Mrs. Fisher, and thank you, Dr. Sachs. Thank you so very much. Um, we are going to now move into our study groups. Uh, facilitators, we went over some uh, different things at our last meeting. Uh, principals who are here, if you would like to attend um, a study group, uh, the Dr. Howard, Dr. Goings, and also Mrs. Roberts sent you links to their study groups and you're ready to go visit. Um, you're, uh, welcome to go visit. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Roberts chairs the study group on social, emotional, and behavior supports. Uh, Dr. Goings facilitate, is facilitating the study group on recruiting and training skilled, competent teachers and administrators. And uh, Dr. Howard, he is chairing the study group on curriculum and instruction. Again, Dr. Sachs, bravo, thank you so much. Um, I wish we could keep you all day. Um, unfortunately, we can't. Um, as I've said all along, we've got 22 very busy people, uh, but those are the best people. If you want something to done to get busy people, you don't wanna get people who are just kind of sitting around. Uh, and so they do have other commitments. Um, some of our um, members are teachers and they have to get back to their their classrooms, uh, the virtual classrooms, some of them. But again, Dr. Sachs, thank you so very, very much. Did you have any closing comments? I can give you about one minute. Okay. Um, yeah, the, again, there's, there's a lot more to say on each of these topics. And I also offer a workshop on LGBTQIA because another common pushback you'll get is, hey, we know better. The male, female binary is a social construct. We understand that gender is a spectrum. Uh, well, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, my book, Why Gender Matters, has 12 chapters. Four of those 12 chapters are devoted to gender nonconforming, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Uh, that doesn't cancel this. This all matters. Yes, LGBTQIA is important, but to really understand LGBTQIA, you have to begin by understanding the reality of gender and then understand how LGBTQIA deepens and expands our understanding of a gender. It doesn't cancel it. All right, All right. wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Sachs. And hopefully um, task force members, if you only read your portion of the book, that you'll now be motivated to go back and read uh, the rest. Uh, Dr. Simpson, um, are there any things that I need to mention or? 
No, none that I can think of. Okay, all right. Um, I did want to share one thing though. Um, uh, let me see. I did not have this for the facilitators meeting. I'm sharing my screen now. Um, for our next month's meeting for jo Dr. Jawanza Kunjufu, um, I emailed this to everyone. So facilitators, if you can please make sure that everyone selects selects uh, their reading assignment for next time for uh, our meeting on October 8th, right? So at this time, uh, I ask that you move into your breakout sessions. Uh, you should have received the, uh, you should have, am I muted? Okay, you should have received the links to your breakout sesh, um, um, sessions. If you have not, Please let me know now and we'll make sure that your facilitator knows. All right, I don't see any hands being raised. All right, thank you so much for it. Um, thank you facilitators and facilitators. We will forego to give you more time. We will forego you returning for that 15 minutes at the end. So right up until um, 12 noon and dismiss your groups as well. And principals, again, you are welcome to visit whatever study group you'd like. Thank you, everyone. See you next month. Take care.